Welcome to the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. We hope you enjoy the following quick take on international affairs while we all wait out the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Hello, my name is Craig Whiteside. On behalf of the World Affairs Council of Monterey Bay, I'd like to present uh, The ISIS Reader. It is a book talk. Um, I'm a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School here in Monterey. I teach for the Naval War College. We're a satellite campus here, uh, and I teach professional military education to military officers. This is a, a book that I co-authored with uh, Horror Ingram of Australia and Charlie Winter of the United Kingdom, and it's titled The ISIS Reader, Milestone Text of the Islamic State Movement. And what I'm providing here as well is a shorter, um, shorter text of, of the book, and that's an article we published in the CTC Sentinel at West Point uh, in January 2020 called Lessons from the Islamic State Milestone Text. And speeches, for those of you who are looking for a shorter version, thought I'd offer that up front uh, to uh, pique your interest in uh, checking out one or both of these um, texts uh, that um, you can use to follow up anything from the, the talk that I'm given. Um, so this is, uh, this is a book talk of, of this book that came out in March. Uh, my background, uh, again, I teach here at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, my PhD dissertation in international relations was on the Islamic State's political worldview. I've been studying them since uh, I was a practitioner, U.S. Army officer in Iraq in 2007, first came across this group. And uh, I'll explain some of that as part of uh, the background or the brief history of the movement. And um, my PhD went into a lot of the text and uh, some of that research uh, is seen, you can see in the, the ISIS reader. Um, what I'd like to do today is cover a real brief history of the movement. A lot of you probably know or have heard of this particular group, the Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, whatever. It, uh, lots of, it's got lots of different names, but it is all uh, the same entity. Uh, cover, again, briefly the Islamic State status today um, as we look at it, and then give you some pertinent thoughts, or at least these are my thoughts on why the Islamic State, what's the significance of the Islamic State movement, and, and how does it matter to us as Americans, first and foremost. And then concluding thoughts and provide some resources for, for you to further investigate if you so choose. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, getting an opportunity to, to talk to you and uh, appreciate your curiosity uh, in learning about this topic. Uh, one caveat, uh, these are my views. These, do, these views do not reflect uh, the United States Navy, a Naval Postgraduate School, the Naval War College, or the U.S. government. Thank you. Generally, how we look at the Islamic State movement over time that we is, is um, my co-authors and I, not necessarily uh, the U.S. government or larger aspects, but it's a growing appreciation is that the, the Islamic State as a movement which has ebbed and flowed and has uh, splintered, fractured, come back together, and um, otherwise uh, had a differing relationship with uh, its parent, its, its uh, previous parent, Al-Qaeda, uh, the base. And um, we look at it in four different phases. Rapid expansion as a terrorist group, a group that's largely geared towards uh, conducting terror attacks and, and not much else, some very nascent forms of uh, trying to govern territory and control territory. Uh, the second phase is defeat, or uh, years in the desert defeat by the uh, United States and its coalition in Iraq in 2006 and 7 during the surge, but also based uh, or due to uh, tribal awakening, uh, backlash of, of Sunni tribes and resistance rivals against the Islamic State at the time. Um, from 2012 on is um, regrowth um, to the caliphate period which is established in 2014, uh, governing territory outright. And uh, that period lasts for approximately uh, three to four years. By 2017, the caliphate, by the end of 2017, the caliphate's crushed and they're back to uniformly being insurgents 
uh, not just in Iraq and Syria though, but uh, across the world and that's something that I'll present. These are pictures of some of their, the leaders that are included in some of the texts of the ISIS reader. And I won't go through these, but we've done research into all of these figures. Some of these are, these are largely from uh, ISIS propaganda or Islamic State propaganda over time. Uh, legends of the state are, are people that uh, have contributed in an important way in their view to the growth of the group. Uh, legends of the state, probably the top, the founder uh, on the left, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, fairly infamous, uh, but other very significant figures like Muhammad al-Adnani and Abu Ali al-Ambari who are on that particular um, propaganda piece. Uh, the new caliph, the, the alleged new caliph, Haji Abdullah, we're not really sure if it's him. Uh, there's differing accounts on to whether or not it is, but he does fit the profile we've, we've put together on what leaders of the Islamic State uh, look like. And he would be the fourth leader uh, in, the, in the last 15 years. And then you have Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, who was the previous caliph who was killed uh, in the late fall, November of 2019. So some key dates. And I'll just I'll run through these fairly quickly. Um, the movement's not really founded, but it has its origins in Afghanistan uh, in the late 1990s under uh, the, the founder, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. It moves to Iraq in 2002 because of the invasion of Afghanistan. They begin a campaign in Iraq uh, post-occupation is uh, or some of their first attacks, although it's, it's quite possible that they were doing attacks in the region, uh, particularly in Jordan. Uh, at the time. They uh, joined Al-Qaeda in 2004, pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden himself. Uh, after a long negotiation, uh, Al-Qaeda was not sure they wanted this particular uh, affiliate uh, under Zarqawi, um, largely because of what happens next, which is a, a, an accelerated sectarian war, which really begins in 2003 uh, with some of their attacks, uh, but it certainly continues on and, and gets to a head about 2006. This group established itself in 2006, in October. It declared the Islamic State of Iraq, and that is really the, the start of the actual organization that we know today as the Islamic State. It's been relatively, it's evolved significantly since 2006, but it is largely uh, the same people, ideas, and uh, you know, structure, uh, not accounting for growth. Uh, that, uh, you see there's a, the, the phase where they were defeated, post-surge, um, and then um, it's really the Syrian rebellion and other geopolitical events in 2011 that give them some oxygen for the embers, and they're able to um, gain territory in Syria and then later Iraq, um, although they've never really stopped fighting in Iraq um, during that 2008 to 10 period. Uh, they do break with Al Qaeda officially in 2013, but as I'll talk about, it's it's quite probable that this group has had different ideas about how to establish the caliphate in a much more timely manner than its uh, previous uh, parents in Al Qaeda, and um, that they've got a serious difference of opinion that really you can see as early as 2006 and 7 when they declare an Islamic State without permission of Al-Qaeda. And Islamic State means something very specific in an uh, in Islamic context. Uh, 2014, we talked about the Caliphate is established over newly conquered territory in both Syria and Iraq joined together. And by 2017, that Caliphate project has been crushed by a coalition led by the United States and many others and their insurgents again. Very briefly, without getting too deep, uh, they are, they call themselves, this is what they call themselves, uh, Salafi Jihadists. The, the principles of this particular ideological, they're highly ideological uh, movement, uh, militant movement, and these are the tenets uh, of note is association and disassociation uh, which allows them or focuses their propaganda on in-group who can be members of their organization and movement and support it, uh, and who is not, who is an enemy. Uh, and that 
uh, like many ideological aspects, it helps differentiate uh, friend from foe. Uh, and takfir, as a principle, uh, gives uh, the Islamic State uses it for justification for um, excommunication of certain people and sanctions, heavy sanctions, to include death for people who fall outside of what their view of a good Muslim is. And then finally, um, jihad, the, the way political change is going to come about, the way the political project, the caliphate is going to be established, is going to be through uh, the use of armed force and violence. So um, that's the embrace of, of jihad, which is a, a much larger concept, but in their very narrow uh, context, they're looking at it to achieve political ends uh, and those, um, yeah, so it's a full embrace of, of jihad in that aspect. And then the Salaf is just, the reason it's, it's called Salafi Jihadi is that they emulate the companions of the Prophet in what they consider to be a, a golden era or age of, of Islam. And the rules that uh, they prefer, they, they prefer those particular rules uh, and laws to more modern uh, rules and laws. And, and of course, all of these rules and laws should come from uh, the guidance, uh, the divine guidance. Uh, lastly, that they embrace, despite this association, disassociation seems like a very restrictive concept and a concept that could really harm their growth as an insurgency, but they have a, do, they do have an expansive view of uh, who can participate in their project um, certainly pending ideological indoctrination, and that is the idea that uh, there's a global ummah, there's a global community of Muslims, and that any Muslim, an American Muslim, can come and fight for the Islamic State uh, in any of its, uh, either its core or its in affiliates. Okay, uh, so moving, along, moving forward to the current situation, uh, I've got a map, the lower right, you can see uh, in um, lighter shade of pink or peach is the kind of the core areas that they lost since 2015 uh, during the caliphate period, that third phase that I described earlier. And in dark, the darker were the, the last remnants um, that they lost and before uh, the end of 2017. So you can, and then if you look on the upper left, you can see 2020, so several years later, say a couple years later, you can see um, that this is activity, these are attack, this is attack data that's been collected uh, by Aaron Zellin in uh, Iraq and Syria for the first part of 2020, and you can see there's still activities roughly in along the same areas uh, to give you an idea of why the past is very important to, to our discussion of, of, of our current situation. Uh, this is a very recent uh, report in May from CTC's um, West Point, uh, the Counterterrorism Center there, and it just shows you there kind of uh, from attack pr uh, data perspective, terror attacks or insurgent attacks, doesn't, they don't uh, distinguish here, uh, which I think is helpful. Uh, what you see is uh, they're kind of a bounce off the bottom again. Uh, we've seen them. We've seen them uh, wax and wane, right? Since since 2004, um, in various phases, uh, as I discussed earlier. So this is their current phase. It looks like they're bouncing off bottoms. Not to say that this trend will continue, uh, but this this is the current trend uh, going back to the beginning of 2018. This shows you their expanse in Africa, which uh, there's been periods, I think 2016, their, their most active franchise was IS West Africa, which you can see in the pink in the center, uh, Northeast Nigeria. Uh, but they've also have quite a bit of activity uh, in the blue in um, the greater Sahel, uh, in Mali, uh, in Niger. And then um, we've got uh, attacks in the Congo which are relatively new and also underreported, we think. So that uh, blue in the light blue in the center is, um, is trending upward significantly and quite possibly underreported. Uh, and then uh, probably the newest groups of attacks we've seen are actually in Southeast Africa and Mozambique. 
And so um, you've got some Al Qaeda, the rivals Al Qaeda activity, you've got activity up in Libya, but as a continent, uh, there's quite a bit of Islamic State and Al Qaeda uh, activity that is uh, much, much more uh, accelerated than we saw maybe three years ago. So that's one aspect where IS is actually Islamic State is is actually advancing. And then to show you uh, a global uh, perspective, this comes out of ACLED, uh, which is a database tracking um, attacks across the globe and stability. You can see, uh, in addition to Africa, certainly the core area of Iraq and Syria, uh, Sinai, which is uh, the hotspot just to the left of Iraq and Syria. Uh, quite a bit of activity in Af Afghanistan, the uh, ISIS Khorasan province, uh, the ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan uh, is a rival of both the Taliban and fighting the, the uh, government of uh, Afghanistan and uh, its American supporters. And uh, you can see some increased activity. Sri Lanka We've had some high visibility terror attacks there. Uh, limited activity in Malaysia, but more in Indonesia and southern Philippines, Mindanao, where you had a very significant battle and the, the city of Marawi was taken over by ISIS-inspired uh, militants who uh, were aspiring to create the uh, East Asia province. Uh, they weren't successful, uh, but they were able to hold a major city in, uh, in Mindanao in the Philippines for about five to six months. Okay, so that, that catches us up. Um, and then what I'd like to do now is, is talk about three insights from the book that aren't they're not necessarily presented in the book, but for a more general audience, I thought uh, I would kind of present things that I've taken away from the research that went into this book and research uh, that I've done on the group in general, as well as um, my role here teaching national security at the, at the Naval Postgraduate School to military officers. This is something we think and talk about a lot, obviously, American national security and American leadership. Um, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, it's quite possible it's a very long standing debate about America's role in the world, uh, the effects of, let's say, COVID or even uh, the Trump administration's role or even reluctance to embrace a very um, gl global role as a leader of multinational efforts as opposed to more of an American first perspective. So, um, stepping outside of that, stepping from an apolitical perspective that we that we would teach here for uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School to our our students, um, the thing that I would offer is you know, American leadership does make a difference, and that you can see here in the in the text in the book the results of American involvement, and you can see where we're doing too much. Let's say in Afghanistan, regime change, Iraq, regime change, Libya, regime change in 2011, different administration, and then Iran, uh, 2017 on, yet even another administration of maximum pressure campaigns. Uh, that the, the Iran 2017 is certainly too early to, to make any kind of uh, uh, you know, valuable uh, claim, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very high risk uh, effort uh, and you can say that same thing with Iraq in 2003 and Libya unknowingly in 2011. So I, I feel like it will end up in that category. But you can also see, you know, con I'll contrast that with areas that, uh, that I'll, I'll try to show you some examples from the book of where America's done, doing too little. Iraq after 2011, uh, where we think we're leaving, but we completely leave and uh, our plans to influence the mitigation or the containment of what was, uh, you know, what is the Islamic State of Iraq at the time uh, is, is not successful. It's obviously not successful. It's dramatically not successful. Uh, Libya, where we do the regime change, we do a lot, but we don't do a lot post-regime change. And Libya, as you could see from the previous uh, slide, has got Islamic State activity there, right? So, um, like Afghanistan that has Islamic State activity there, the, 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 the vacuum is filled by extremist militants uh, in Afghanistan, 
They're filled by extremist militants in Iraq after 2003, and they're also uh, filled with extremist militants in Libya. And then Syria joins that particular club. Uh, the, there, it's no shock that this that uh, the Islamic states, even though most of their effort from my research has always been dedicated to Iraq, that they're more successful in Syria in 2013, then it takes them another six months to almost a year to uh, be as successful in Iraq as they were in Syria. And that's more because the Iraqi government was a, a little bit more cohesive um, at the time. To show that this is an, not all a bad news story, um, there are areas where we get it right just enough. Iraq in 2007, obviously you don't want to put yourself into that position uh, by making mistakes in 2003 and upending um, the, the regime in Iraq in 2003, but by 2007, a situation that's becoming quite catastrophic, and as someone who is in Iraq uh, in an infantry unit in in the surge in, in Iraq in 2007, I can tell you that the, the things are not going well at all. And it is about to be a complete disaster uh, with, with possibilities of an American withdrawal under fire in that, in that country. And um, some extra efforts and some smarter philosophies, tactics, strategies, and uh, some better diplomacy uh, helps fix the situation in 2007 and stabilize it uh, for what looks like another seven years, and that's that's as good as it was going to probably get. Uh, it could have been better, but uh, certainly that that effort there. Um, Iraq and Syria, since the establishment of the caliphate, uh, the global coalition against the Islamic State or ISIS or Daesh, it has been uh, really. Um, almost an unqualified success. It's, uh, it's excellent uh, diplomatic effort into uh, putting together a 79 state coalition uh, and also the way it was done as far as light, low footprint, um, the onus on Iraq or Syrian uh, partners to do the heavy work uh, but with a lot of support from American air power and such. Uh, my only criticism would be uh, some of the air power aspects uh, have been, uh, uh, they've caused a lot of civilian casualties and that's something that's a little underreported. And it also creates a new set of difficulties, if you will, post uh, 2017 on, on making sure that the Islamic State can't take advantage of, of the chaos left behind. American support to the Philippines in 2017, relatively unheralded, but it's, it's not saying that the, United, that the Philippine government would have been able to do it with, they wouldn't have been able to do it without us, but it's, they've got significant but quiet American support in terms of um, drone assets, uh, a lot of um, surveillance, intelligence surveillance uh, assets for the drones. Uh, that allowed them a better, better idea. So American technology assistance and advising comes into play to help defeat this particular group's affiliate in Marawi in Mindanao. And then finally, you know, with, with one particular exception in measure, the uh, efforts of the U.S., really proactive efforts to try to uh, constrain the growth of jihadism, which as you can see from the Africa uh, the slide of um, terror and insurgent attacks in, in Africa by Al Qaeda and Islamic State militants. It's 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 fairly explosive growth there, but the, the efforts to really engage that early on has been um, has been a plus, I think. Okay. Uh, the second takeaway that I have is not about. Us, it is about them, and that's that it might reflect a little bit about us, uh, but largely this is the 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 efficacy of violence. And in the literature, um, there's a there's a lot of uh, and let's say terrorism studies literature, for example, that it, excessive violence uh, is actually you know has a boomerang effect. It's detracting from political uh, goals and uh, can. And it, and it erodes um, support of populations. 
uh, especially local populations that are subjected to violence or instability. So uh, that, that's the general conventional wisdom. And you can see it here, uh, just I've got a few texts from the book that to, to highlight the, uh, the examples here. Um, the, the founder of what becomes the Islamic State, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, writes his uh, su soon to be or tentative supervisor, um, who's Osama bin Laden's deputy, uh, Zawahiri, and he writes him and, and get, lays out his strategy and says, we have to use violence if we're going to be successful here, and we need to do it. And he almost uses really what in terrorism studies looks at um, the strategies of terrorism in some famous pieces, and that's provocation. You provoke the government to overreact. Uh, Two, you have to rally people to your side. Well, if, the, if you can provoke the government to re react, that will in turn rally um, co-ethnics to your side. So if you provoke a Shia government to overreact and to punish and ethnically cleanse Sunnis, then they will come rally to your banner. Uh, and then finally, outbidding, because there's a lot of other groups in Iraq other than Al-Qaeda's uh, soon-to-be franchise under Zarqawi. There are they have to outcompete all of these other groups and they have to do it. You know, and violence is a, a pretty high visibility way to kind of uh, claim leadership amongst uh, a really chaotic group of competitors, right? If you can imagine a, a field of competitors that don't have uh, any kind of rules, uh, the game, there's no rules to the game. There's no rule to the competition. Um, it's like having an election, but there are no rules. So anything goes. And so violence becomes uh, an important aspect of that. Um, Zawahiri answers the Zartawi in 2005 and says, stop what you're doing. That, that your strategy to make uh, what is now the Al-Qaeda franchise in, in Iraq, uh, it, it's making us look bad. It's, 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 you're killing mostly other Muslims. And I don't really, that doesn't really play well on television at the global audience. Um, so you can see this is not just our perception, but it's, and, and it's not just terrorism studies or, or popular theories in terrorism studies about, the, about how violence, uh, the use of terrorism usually backfires, it doesn't work. Um, here, um, this, is, uh, this is an Al-Qaeda perspective. Of course, it's ironic because Al-Qaeda is the one that uses terrorism uh, on 9-11 in uh, dramatic ways and certainly clearly targeting civilians in that particular attack. Uh, and yet they're telling their franchise, uh, with the, the one that becomes the Islamic State, that uh, this violence is, isn't helpful. Um, what we see on the ground, though, is that, that violence is what makes Al-Qaeda the strongest insurgent group in Iraq uh, prior to 2007. And that's, that's written in U.S. intelligence estimates that are, that are eventually made public that Al-Qaeda is dominating large parts of Iraq in 2006. And that's what um, instigates a decision whether to leave Iraq dramatically uh, or, or uh, in an accelerated timeline or to double down and do the surge. And it's largely Al-Qaeda that is, you know, Al-Qaeda's franchise, the, what's, what's soon to be the Islamic State of Iraq in 2007, is the impetus for that. It was violence that makes them popular. It's also possibly violence that makes them uh, suffer the backlash uh, and the, the, the focus of the United States from about 2006 on. Uh, and that, that, tend, that puts them back. Uh, that, that's when they suffer their first defeat. Um, and then the Fallujah Memorandum is a, a, a text that we have in the, in the ISIS reader. It's her strategy, really their political and military strategy from 2009. It's, it's, uh, it ends up on the internet. We're able to um, find it, translate it. And what it does is it really talks about, looks at how strategic the group is and who they're gonna use violence against. And it turns out post 2009, they're not very interested in using violence against the United States because they see the United States is already having committed to leaving. And therefore it makes much more sense for them to save their ammunition more uh, rhetorically, save their, their ammunition uh, for their local rivals, other Sunnis who are challenging them for leadership in the communities, uh, local communities, regional leadership, um, and then also the national level, which is um, 
influenced in their perception by um, the neighboring state Iran and is against the Sunnis and is not, um, it becomes a, a really good foil for them to, to use in uh, advocating for, for uh, taking up arms against their own government, uh, the Iraqi government. Uh, so that's what they're focused on. Uh, it is their own hearts and minds idea. They, they have a very solid constituency that they want to target and win over, and that's largely rural tribesmen. And what, they, what they're actually looking to do is, um, and if, if you don't have either the potential or propensity to join them either now or in the future, then you are targeted for, if you're a, a collaborator with the government, they target you with violence and they are public about it. And so again, violence, violence is um, a large part of the comeback that they make between 2009 and 14. And you don't really read about that. It's really under-researched and we try to lay it out a little bit in the book and I've done some research on this particular part um, but violence is an important aspect of that. To show you some examples, this is from early 2004, um, a beheading vi video. This is just an outtake uh, from it. Um, you can see most of the people, all of the people who are on the, um, in this particular video were actually masked, but they've got the photos, of, the real photos of who they are above. And they're all from the legends of the state uh, picture that I showed you earlier. They're all high-level leaders or future high-level leaders of the Islamic State. And they're, they're, this is their first viral video. Uh, the movement's first viral video is May 2004. It's the beheading of Nicholas Berg. It's fairly famous. Probably had a million hits back in 2004. So you can see uh, even in the early days, uh, they have had this idea and this integration of violence with propaganda. And this kind of summarizes the, the larger strategy that they use to come back, um, largely um, taking advantage of state failure in Syria and some instability and uh, sectarianism in Iraq's government um, that uh, kind of amplifies, uh, exaggerates their own propaganda. Uh, during this period, uh, particularly with their expansion into Syria, the, they've, they've got ideas about going global, um, and that's largely because uh, of probably, again, these differences that they have with their parent Al-Qaeda on uh, both the efficacy of violence and uh, the importance of governing at the local level. The Islamic State's an advocate of that. They're an advocate of armed politics within uh, their own community, their own Muslim communities, and Al Qaeda has always been focused. Al Qaeda Central has always been focused on the Americans. You can see from the previous slide that, that or the two previous slides, that um, the Islamic State's already looking past the Americans, even though the Americans are still in Iraq in 2009. So there's there's significant differences there that then probably inspire them. Don't have any smoking gun in their own internal documents that where they decide to take on and, and break away or, or to take the acts that will eventually cause the, the, the schism between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. But, but somewhere in this period is when we see the seeds for it. Okay, so my third point of three is uh, something that I, this is my research focus really, particularly since I teach military officers, also a former military officer, uh, turned academic, and that's uh, the, their insurgency doctrine, uh, how they look at the long fight, right? This idea of insurgency uh, mixed with terrorism. Uh, certainly uh, quite a bit adapted from Mao and other jihadist strategists, uh, but I've, I've come to view it as very distinct, very much in their own flavor of, of insurgency. They have three phases, much like Mao. Um, there's not a lot of consistency on what they call it. Um, these are the Arabic terms for it, but it is a mix of, uh, of attrition, uh, guerrilla warfare, and uh, what they call tamkin, which is consolidation or empowerment, that, that last phase. That's a very political term, and that means that they're, they're governing. They are, uh, maybe prior to that, they are conducting shadow government activities, taxation, education, 
um, courts, Islamic courts tend to be the first. So to try to instill order into areas that have deep instability. And this is done for much larger than uh, simple hearts and minds methodology. They really believe that control itself of ground and the implementation of Islamic principles will eventually convert even the unconverted to uh, seeing things their way, if you will. And so these, this, these aren't things that they have necessarily made up either. A lot of these predate the, uh, the organization and movement and come out of the larger jihadist movement. Uh, but I would argue that they have created their own insurgency doctrine. It is quite effective. It's very well integrated with the propaganda uh, that I talked about before, violent or nonviolent. Right, violent or they're governing, they have quite a bit. I think a study in 2016 showed that over half of their propaganda was governance related. It showed security, stability, uh, a lack of crime, uh, the you know, children playing and uh, education. So these are types of things that they're focused on. <clears throat> And that's something that we don't attribute to this group. These, none of these are uh, uh, Islamic State. Um, these are all the predecessors that I lay out here. Um, Suri on the right, you can see him talking to Osama bin Laden in the upper center. Uh, but the fact that they, there are attempts and fairly sophisticated attempts by Al Qaeda to develop um, an insurgency strategy, if you will, but it, as you can see in the left, you know, in Michael Ryan's book, the, they look at it as a deep battle against America. And what we see here and haven't really articulated well is something that I'm working on is their Islamic State's uh, doctrine for insurgency and guerrilla warfare. And that is, is gonna be different from all of these, but it's built, it's built largely on these ideas um, but they're the only ones who've seen these come into fruition by building, uh, establishing, and maintaining a caliphate even for three years. The things they've learned from that uh, have are, are have shaped a, a, a doctrine that looks quite different from any of the ones you can see here by any of the authors, Mukrin, um, Suri, any of these. And you can see they're talking about it early on. This is again the founder Abu Musab al-Zarqari in a speech that uh, we have, I think it's in the book, uh, but if not, it's something that I've read, um, covered in my other research, and that's uh, his his description here. He's he's defending the movement, saying that pe that all of this activity, all of this guerrilla warfare activity, is just an irritation, and they're not trying to achieve empowerment, which is political political empowerment or governing. And certainly, he's he's. <laughs> His defense is that you know the United States is here when they when they if we can force them out, um, you know we and they will leave. Uh, then then we can get there, but we need to be patient. Is is really what he's arguing, uh, and it's why he had his own strategy of attacking the Iraqi government first and foremost. That was really his idea, and he was criticized for it. That uh, again, like I mentioned. But he really sees that if you can frustrate the development of a nascent government and its security forces while the United States is there, that when the United States leaves, they will fall apart. And it's almost prophetic what, what happens in that regard. And you can see what their insurgency doctrine looks like from a data perspective. This is data that I collected in blue compared to uh, really standard um, activity and terror uh, indices that are popular, like Global Terrorism Database, which is in red, uh, or Iraqi Body Count, which is in green, that's just uh, deaths in Iraq. But in blue, you can see Islamic State claimed attacks, and you can see the, the slow increase in attacks, or not so slow increase in attacks. Uh, and this is just in Iraq prior to, um, prior to the caliphate being established. And here's an, another example of sophistication. As early as 2007, you can see the type of structure. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a decentralized structure that we tend to think of when we look at militant groups, particularly ones under pressure from states and quite capable states like the United States. 
So you have a very a hierarchy here, media director, deputy, and then internal committees, and then a bunch of sub offices that are all specialized in a bureaucracy. And that's quite, quite a, a perfect way to describe their structure. Uh, this is their structure in 2015 and it's global. And they have media offices all around the world that are transmitting material back to the central. So again, very centralized control, um, decentralized execution of something. So they're collecting, they're doing their own filming, but it's all vetted uh, at the very top. And there's a specialty uh, departments or foundations that support the, uh, the central media uh, to make it uh, to perfect the, the the message, if you will, and then 2018. So just two years later, um, this graph, which you can you can look at later, this really shows uh, a quite sophisticated compartmentalization of the media department, so that it also can maintain security now that it's returned to its guerrilla guerrilla state. Uh, and that's because all of these transactions have to be clandestine, even the ones that are done on the internet, because those are tracked very carefully by the United States. So there's a, a very, uh, there's security integrated into all aspects, but this is a very sophisticated organizational chart as, as most of you might, if you can figure it out, you know, you, you can help me. I, I think I understand this chart. Uh, but but largely, uh, it's, it's really just an example of how, of how sophisticated uh, their media production is. And their media has still produced, not at the same volume, but certainly produced uh, quality material um, that, that lives up to their reputation. Uh, and it's done so despite the loss of territory and any kind of fixed facility that it might have had. So to conclude, um, some, some points that I'd like to make, we, the discussions we have on national security here uh, in my classes at the National Postgraduate School, Naval Postgraduate School is largely uh, about China and Russia. And, and what does uh, what the buzzword great power competition, what does that look like? What does the future of warfare look like? Cyber warfare, AI, all of these complexities, um, but I'm, you know, from looking at the the ebb and flow of this particular movement, this this jihadist movement, um, and th this isn't an excuse. Th these, and, and we've got other issues, right? COVID nineteen, um, a very uh, divisive political environment uh, currently internally to the United States in. You know, these are all really good reasons not to bother to learn from our experience of you know defeating the Islamic State and, and defeat and Klaus, from Clausewitz or from Clausewitz, defeat is a temporary condition. It is always a temporary condition, and it's a con, it's a condition that lasts until you know people decide to take up arms again and fight, or or there's a resolution to whatever the dispute is that led to violence and war. So. And this is a this is a good time to you know step away from these other really pressing issues uh, if that's possible and and try to think about you know why are we in the position we are with this particular group and how do we prevent yet another uh, even greater um, you know return or resurgence of this particular group uh, because the, the 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 you know the second coming of the Islamic State which we just went through. Um, was quite costly for civilians in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, particularly Africa, and uh, and still is in Africa, and um, certainly uh, the city of Mosul or Raqqa, the the, the capitals, the, the dual capitals of the Islamic State were were completely leveled, and thousands of civilians were killed in this effort to to restrain them. So. Um, th I think that's a good reason to try to try to try to understand. What, what we think we've learned and how to do better to prevent uh, another recurrence of this. Uh, because second point, they're not going away. They have deep roots that predate the Islamic State, that really predate the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But it is, it is these really careless, um, careless or mistaken 
um, adventures of the United States that have created an environment that has fueled this movement. Um, and they have taken, at the same time, they've taken advantage of uh, lapses uh, in attention uh, of the United States or more wishful kind of thinking of, uh, by the United States that, that, that we are the cause of the problem, that we can be the cause of the problem, but we, we also um, are the, we are a large part of the solution to uh, at least maintain this at a very low level. Um, one of the problems we have is that we cannot prop, we cannot wish away the success that they've had. That success is something um, is something that energizes them, that keeps them going, even though they should not still be fighting 15 years after the creation of the of the, the predecessor, but certainly. Uh, it'll soon be 15 years since the creation of an establishment of the Islamic State of Iraq in 2006. So, you know, we we're going to have to deal with this legacy. That 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 sense of power and accomplishment is energizing for insurgents who more often lose than win, right? So, um, and we just can't wish it away. We can't. We've declared victory twice. And, and, uh, or three times, actually, sorry, three times, and um, none of those were true. Um, defeating them is not the same. Their defeat is not the same thing as our victory. Um, so we, we've got to be at least cognizant of that fact that people are going to use their defeat for political purposes. Um, we're going to use their defeat for political purposes, but um, that's, that's not that necessarily uh, the, the strategic reality. And then finally, this success, let's just say in the media department, but certainly in terror tactics and, uh, and in many, many other ways, their, their insurgency strategy are going to be co are copied endlessly. I think you can see that almost from, let's say, right-wing extremists who are emboldened to challenge weak, weak states that are much weaker than they appeared. Um, again, why Al-Qaeda was advocating for, you know, fight the United States and get them out. Um, the, the local governments are too weak, was always Al Qaeda, or too strong, was always Al Qaeda's message. And, and that, the Islamic State showed them it was the opposite. The United States is still strong. They will still be here, but they, but they will wander off eventually. It's still local governments that are weak and can be attacked, and in some cases can be collapsed. Their security forces can be collapsed, and we can take advantage of that. And so I think you're going to see whether attitudinally or tactically or strategically or techno technologically, there are going to be extremists, militant extremist groups from across the spectrum are going to uh, try to ape, uh, imitate the, uh, what they saw the Islamic State be successful with, even if it took you know, 79 states to kind of get them to, to reduce their caliphate to nothing and and to, to get them back into a low state of insurgency. Uh, nonetheless, the, the, the lesson will be that, 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 they, that they found success in X and, and we should try that. So uh, I guess that's, that's saying that we, you know, again, reinforces the first, my first conclusion there um, that um, this, is, this is the time, uh, as much as we've got other things going on, to, to try to learn from, from this experience. So I'll end with some resources and you can use these to either conduct follow-up uh, research or fulfill any curiosities that you have, address any curiosities you have. Uh, the ISIS Reader book, uh, you can find it on Amazon or um, Oxford University Press is a site. Uh, you can just Google the ISIS Reader and either the Amazon or Oxford will come up. And that is obviously it's a it's a book that will have great detail for you in, in much much greater detail than I was able to to produce in this short period of time. Uh, the short version of our book you can read in the CTC uh, Sentinel from West Point, in January 2020, and I have the link there for you. Uh, you can go to the ISIS Reader website, which has blogs. We just started a blog on. Um, current events and how it um, reflects uh, some of the insights that we have in the book. Uh, it's also got uh, some, we've done about four or five podcasts 
and interviews on the book uh, as, as co-authors, my co-authors, Charlie and Hero and I. And you can find those all on our, our book website there. Um, I have a significant amount of articles that you could dig into any of the aspects of my presentation here uh, at my Google uh, Scholarly site. It's got articles, uh, but you're, if you don't have access to some of the most, almost all of them you can, you can access for free. Uh, but there are, there are a few, there's a handful of uh, academic articles that will, you need to have a library access to. Uh, but I'm more than willing to send them to you in a PDF if you're really, really interested in, let's say, Islamic State Special Operations or their campaign against the Tribal Awakening uh, or their um, propaganda messaging and slogans against the Tribal Awakening, uh, which I mentioned during the brief. Um, I'll post, when these are posted and, and freely available, I'll post these on my Twitter account and I'll be happy to uh, conduct a Q&A. One of the things I miss from presenting in public is, is the opportunity to learn from and engage with all of you on uh, questions that you have, but questions that make me smarter and make me think harder about um, what, what I'm studying and uh, what we should do for policy for that. So uh, I'll be happy to uh, post as soon as I can, probably as soon as you have access to it. Uh, if it's if it's freely available, I'll I'll go ahead and and post those on my Twitter account, and you're welcome to question me there. Or finally, the old-fashioned way, or maybe not the old-fashioned way, but a more 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 medium-fashioned way is uh, you're welcome to email me. Uh, that's my NPS email. It's an official government email, so you're welcome to uh, email me there about questions from this presentation. Thanks for your time. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and honor to, um, to talk to fellow citizens who are interested in what is going on uh, globally from foreign policy uh, or other aspects uh, of, of America's engagement with the rest of the world. As I pointed out, America is, is, uh, is an, hopefully an indispensable leader for some of the problems that, that we have. Um, I think that's, that's going to be a necessity, and I think a lot of countries are, are looking for that in, in various areas. And so we'll see how that plays out, but, um, but I'm, I much appreciate uh, your time and your interest and curiosity, and I uh, hope to engage with you further. Thank you. Have a great day.